Hello, and welcome to this session on scientific rigor and transparency. I'm Devin Crawford, and I am in the Office of Research Quality at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, or NINDS. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about this important topic. First, I have to give my disclaimer that all of my opinions are my own, and I don't speak on behalf of the government. Here's an outline of the presentation. It will serve as a roadmap for where we will be going. First, I will give an introduction to rigor and transparency, and then I will tell a short story about ALS, and then we'll talk about the feed forward cycle of research quality and the five ways to improve experimental rigor. And then we will revisit the story of ALS. So to give you some context for why I am giving this talk, I am in the Office of Research Quality at NINDS, like I said, and NINDS has been leading efforts within NIH to improve experimental rigor and transparency for over a decade. We want to make sure that we are funding quality research projects and not just the flashiest science. So we work both internally on policies related to rigor and transparency, as well as externally on initiatives in education to improve research quality. Now, the topic of rigor and reproducibility has been increasingly discussed in the scientific community due to issues of trying to reproduce high-profile experiments. One problem, however, is that not everyone agrees on the definition of reproducibility. What we really want to know is whether or not something is true, but sometimes things that are true are difficult to reproduce in all contexts, and sometimes things that are reproducible are not necessarily useful. For example, if you repeatedly use a biased study design, you'll probably be able to reproduce a biased result really well. And all of the things listed on this slide can affect the reproducibility of an experiment. For example, your signal to noise ratio or the complexity of the design, your statistical methods and the heterogeneity of your experimental results. And this is why we at NINDS advocate for high quality experimental design through scientific rigor and transparent reporting of methods and results instead of for reproducibility per se. And to make sure everybody's on the same page, I provide definitions for rigor and transparency here. Scientific rigor being the strict application of the scientific method to ensure unbiased and well-controlled experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of results, according to the NIH definition, as well as transparency or reporting all relevant details about how an experiment was planned, executed, analyzed, and interpreted. And that includes unexpected and inconvenient outcomes. So now I'd like to tell you a story about why rigor and transparency are important to NINDS. ALS, as many of you know, is a degenerative motor neuron disease. And Lou Gehrig and Stephen Hawking are high-profile people who have had ALS. However, there is no cure, and people often die within a few years of diagnosis. So for this reason, finding treatments for ALS is one of NINDS's goals. And in the early 2000s, the antibiotic minocycline showed promise as a potential treatment. So it improved survival and motor symptoms in a mouse model of ALS. So that would be the SOD1 transgenic mouse model. And as an example, you can see that minocycline improved survival by the rightward shift in the survival curve shown here. And this result was seen again and again and again. And so that's pretty reproducible, right? Due to these exciting results, NINDS funded a clinical trial of minocycline in human ALS patients. And you can see here that it was a multi-center placebo-controlled trial with 412 patients over nine months. However, the patients on minocycline did not improve on a functional rating scale, and they did not improve in what is called freedom from failure, shown here, which is like a survival curve. And failure is defined as death, tracheostomy, or near total dependence on a ventilator. So this was very disappointing and raised questions about why the animal studies didn't predict how minocycline would respond in humans. Why did minocycline fail? Are mice just not a good model for humans? Or is this particular mouse model not a good model for ALS? Were the animal studies not performed carefully? Or did unconscious biases slip into the experiment? I want you to keep that in the back of your mind during the presentation and we'll return to the minocycline story at the end. For now, let's turn our attention to experimental design. In black is ideally how the scientific life cycle should work. You generate and specify your hypothesis, you design your study, you conduct the study and collect data, 
You analyze data and test the hypothesis. You interpret the results, and then you publish the experiment. But at each of these stages, less rigorous research practices can creep in to help create spurious results. In red, for example, you may fail to control for bias or have low statistical power or poor quality control. Key hacking may be involved, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, or harking, which is hypothesizing after results are known. And then there's the issue of publication bias. Each of these can occur without any intentional fraud or misconduct, but all of these issues work together to weaken the strength of scientific evidence in the literature. So what can we do about it? Well, we can introduce experimental elements into each step that help mitigate some of these issues. For example, we can control for bias. We can make sure that we have high statistical power. We can introduce quality control as well as plan our analyses in advance. And finally, be completely transparent during the publication process. Now, I'll go through each of these five elements in more detail. First, let's look at controlling for bias. I get a lot of questions from scientists about whether or not rigor and transparency are relevant to all kinds of science, like basic translational and clinical science, computational sciences, how about in vitro or in vivo animal studies and not just human studies? Well, like my colleague Shai Silverberg likes to say, no matter what kind of experiments being performed, there's always a vertebrate animal involved. And who is that vertebrate animal? It's us, it's the human, and humans can be biased. And what do I mean by bias in this context? According to this review paper, bias is unintentional and unconscious. It is defined broadly as the systematic erroneous association of some characteristics with a group in a way that distorts the comparison with another group. But what do we do about this bias? From the same review, they suggest that to mitigate the effects of bias, we need to make everything equal during the design, conduct, and interpretation of a study, as well as report those steps in an explicit and transparent way. Some of the strategies that we have for this include blinding or making sure we don't know which group is which during treatment or analysis. There's randomization or randomly assigning a group to treatment so that each sample or person or animal has the same chance of receiving one treatment versus another. We have predetermined inclusion and exclusion criteria or choosing when data should be removed from the data set, uh, for example, outliers before the experiment ever starts. So this prevents you from selecting data for the data set after you know what the data set looks like. Finally, we have objective outcome measures, and this is using things like automation or very clear cut measurements, and this avoids ambiguity and judgment calls by the researcher. So what happens when we don't control for bias with strategies like these? Well, this is a meta-analysis from a systematic review of human studies where they compared the effect sizes, which is like the magnitude of the results, of the outcome measure in both blinded and unblinded assessors in the same study. And it shows what's called the standard mean difference between the blinded and unblinded measures. And the standard mean difference is like a normalized effect size. And in many of the studies, they saw increased effect sizes in the unblinded condition. Um, so they actually wrote in the paper, in 10 trials or 63%, the effect size point estimate was more optimistic as determined by the non-blinded assessor. The lesson here is that we all might see what we want to see when we haven't taken the efforts to eliminate the opportunity for bias. And effect size distortions like this can be seen in preclinical research too. So this is from a systematic review of over a thousand multiple sclerosis animal model papers. And they looked at the effect sizes in the studies that were or were not blinded or randomized. And due to a lack of transparency, we can only look at correlations and assume a lack of reporting meant a lack of practice, that they probably didn't perform the blinding or randomization. But like the more direct studies we saw on the last slide, this suggests that unconscious biases can slip in and artificially inflate effect sizes. So now we will stop and look at this case study. You are a researcher performing behavioral studies in mice. For convenience and organization, you keep the wild type mice on the top shelves of the animal facility and the transgenic mice on the lower shelves of the animal facility. You worry about bias 
So you have a colleague mark the mice with numbers so that when you bring them to the behavior task room, you do not know which animals belong to which group. Which of the following is true? A, you have successfully implemented blinding and are therefore unbiased. B, due to housing conditions, the mice have not been randomized. C, the colleague who numbered the mice is unblinded and may bias the result. Or D, nothing can be done to prevent unconscious bias. What do you think? The answer is D, due to housing conditions, the mice have not been randomized. Let's look a little closer at why this is the answer. So let's look at A. You have successfully implemented blinding and are therefore unbiased. So this is not true because there are measures you can take like randomization to prevent other forms of bias too. You also need to be aware that you might be unblinded if the cages are not randomized when moved to the behavior task room since they've already been separated by genetic status. For B, due to housing conditions, the mice have not been randomized. So that's true because with placement in separate spots in the animal facility, the wild type and transgenic mice might have different levels of light, humidity, noise, handling, and there might be cage or litter mate effects. For C, the colleague who numbered the mice is unblinded and may bias the result. So this is not true because although there is a small chance that the colleague would introduce bias by handling the mice differently, their purpose in the story is to reduce unconscious bias by others through setting up the blinding scheme. And for D, nothing can be done to prevent unconscious bias. Well, we know that's not true because we've learned multiple ways to mitigate bias, even if bias will likely still be present in some amount. All right, let's move on to the second element for mitigating experimental design issues, and that is statistical power. I wanna start with some definitions to make sure everybody's on the same page. So statistical power is equal to one minus the type two error, which is also known as the false negative rate. And overall, this is the probability of observing a statistically significant result if a true effect is present. However, this depends on both the effect size and the sample size. The effect size being the magnitude of the difference between a treatment group and the control group and sample size being the number of subjects, animals, samples, or whatever in the experiment. What's important to note is that power is higher when the effect size and sample size are higher. Now, a typical study aims to have about 80% power to detect the difference between groups, but often the actual power of studies is much lower. And so this figure on the left shows data from 660 meta-analyses in three different disease areas. And the authors use the effect size found in each meta-analysis to estimate the power in each original study that contributed to the meta-analysis. And so as you can see from the histogram, about 50% of the original studies had less than 20% power to detect a real difference between groups. On the right, you can see a graph of effect size versus sample size in these studies. In this case, effect size negatively correlates with sample size, meaning that studies with a low sample size tend to have inflated effect sizes. So this is exacerbated by the fact that studies with low sample size and low effect size probably never get published. And so being underpowered can lead to bias in the results. Now, here's a question related to choosing sample sizes. Professor X tells you that the lab will use 10 animals per group to collect tissue for analysis. They tell you that this sample size is chosen because it is standard in the field and it's what the lab has always done. Is this a valid method for determining sample size? A, yes, or B, no. What do you think is the answer? The answer is no. And that is because this strategy provides no information about the power of the study, the variability of the data, or the expected effect size. So it's impossible to know if 10 animals will be enough to make valid inferences about differences between the groups. And the third element we will discuss is quality control. In 2009, the ALS Therapy Development Institute published a study asking what factors might affect their studies of SOD1 mice, which we heard about earlier in the presentation. So this study took survival data from over 2,000 untreated mice and ran simulations to randomly place them into two groups. And then the authors asked how often they found an apparent difference in survival, which would be a false positive 
since all of these animals were from the control group that had not received any treatment. When they did not control for any factors and used four mice per group, as shown here, they saw apparent differences more than 50% of the time, more than half the time. They were able to decrease the false positive rate when they removed mice with a low copy number of the transgene because these mice just weren't as sick, as well as mice that died of unrelated causes like infection, and they introduced sex and litter matching. Now, keeping the same sample size, they could decrease the rate of apparent effects to about 30%. But increasing the sample size decreased the rate even further. Now, let's say they did not consider any of these confounding factors. Then, increasing the sample size to 50 per group still could not decrease the false positive rate to the 5% level people often think they have when they're using a p-value of less than 0.05 as their cutoff for statistical significance. So all of these things needed to be considered in the experimental design. Controlling for quality through reducing the effect of confounding factors can be very important for keeping the false positive rate at a reasonable level. So now we have another question, true or false. You can always identify all confounding factors before the study begins. The answer is false. You should try to identify as many confounding factors as possible and control for them, but there will probably be unknown unknowns that you cannot identify. So that's why blinding, randomization, ensuring sufficient sample size, and other strategies to reduce systematic biases and improve generalizability are good because they can reduce the effects of unknown confounding factors. We've now made it to our fourth element for mitigating quality issues, and that is analysis planning. So we will discuss why it's important to think through your analyses before you start your experiment. To illustrate this point, this is a study where the authors ran 15,000 simulations on randomly distributed control data and asked how often they found false positives. And here they define false positives as a p-value of less than 0.05 when looking for differences between groups, since this is all control data. And so this is a similar type of study as what we saw earlier, where researchers grouped survival data from mice using simulation, except in this study, all of the data is simulated. They started with 10 samples per group, they tested for a p-value, and then added one, five, 10, or 20 more samples before testing again. And they kept on doing this and only stopped when they saw a p-value of less than 0.05, or they reached 50 samples per group. They found a much higher false positive rate than the expected 5% based on the cutoff of 0.05 for their p-value. And this is because they tested multiple times for group differences, and there will be a false positive rate for each individual test, and so it can add up. So increasing sample size in search of a more robust result, and thereby performing multiple significance tests, can actually introduce more error into the experiment. This is why you should choose your sample size in advance and stick with it, or at the very least, report it if you do not. A similar issue is choosing which analysis you'll use to interpret your data. We all know that it's important to choose the right type of analysis for our data, but just as important is choosing the analysis in advance. And so as we learned with sample size, doing multiple analyses on the data can increase the false positive rate. And not accounting for this can be considered p-hacking, or as we define it, selectively reporting analyses that show a statistically significant result without taking the full context into account. So in the same study as the last slide, the authors performed additional simulations on their control data set to test the effects of what they called experimenter degrees of freedom or selectively reporting when multiple analyses were performed. So in situation A, they started with 20 samples per group and they had two somewhat correlated variables and tested that or their combination. And when they did that, they found a p-value of less than 0.05 somewhere, 9.5% of the time. In situation B, they started with 20 samples per group again, but they kept that t-test or they added 10 more samples before doing another t-test. When they did that, they found p-value of less than 0.05, 7.7% of the time. In situation C, they assigned a binary classifier, for example, yes, no, and they tested for a classifier main effect or for an interaction. And there they were able to find a p-value less than 0.05, 11.7% of the time. In situation D, they started with three groups, 
and they either kept all three groups or dropped one from the analysis. When they did that, they were able to find a p-value less than 0.5, 12.6% of the time. And these are all fairly common practices, but people don't always report them. Now, what is scary is when the authors combine these behaviors. They saw a p-value less than 0.05 somewhere in the analysis up to 60.7% of the time, more than half the time. So once again, this shows you how p-values can be misleading. So it is best to plan your analyses in advance and stick with them. But at the very least, please report all the analyses that you do perform so that other people can properly interpret them. Which brings me to the general point that using null hypothesis significance testing and p-values can be flawed to begin with. P-values were never meant to prove or disprove hypotheses or even indicate the magnitude or importance of a result. Instead, they simply measure the compatibility with a model. Ronald Fisher himself, one of the statisticians responsible for this concept, said in 1935 that if we accept this convenient convention that P less than 0.05 is statistically significant, we thereby admit that no isolated experiment, however significant in itself, can suffice for the experimental demonstration of any natural phenomenon. In other words, a single p-value from a single experiment tells you very little. He went on to say that if the design of an experiment is faulty, any method of interpretation which makes it out to be decisive must be faulty too. So if you haven't designed your experiment well, a p-value doesn't mean very much. And in response to recent abuses of the p-value, the American Statistical Association published a series of editorials on the subject and advised that scientists move to a world beyond p less than 0.05. So instead, they suggest that we be very clear about limitations in our designs and that we accept levels of uncertainty in our studies. Now, assuming you still plan to use p-values in your studies, what are some ways that you can avoid falling into the trap of p-hacking? Well, you could reduce reliance on p-values during the interpretation of your data. You could make and lock an analysis plan before starting the study, so that way you can't go back and change your analyses without somebody knowing about it. You could go even further and pre-register the entire study protocol, which includes the analysis plans. But most of all, we should be transparently reporting unplanned or exploratory analyses and reporting them as unplanned and exploratory analyses. Now, here's an interesting case study. You're performing a series of experiments and stop when you reach the pre-planned sample size. You perform a standard analysis that produces P equals 0.06. You worry about whether you can get the study published without showing a statistically significant result, and a colleague suggests that you add a few more samples to the group. What should you do? Well, in A, you assume the colleague knows best, add a few new samples, C a P equals 0.049, and move forward with writing up the manuscript. In B, you do not want to diverge from your sample size plan, so you use an analysis that is just as valid but provides a better p-value in the manuscript. In C, you put a note in the manuscript that the data were not significant and so do not need to be shown. Or D, you report the experiment as is in the manuscript and put the p-value in context with the effect size and variability of the data, and you perform further experiments to tackle the research question. So what would you do in this situation? You should D, report the experiment as is in the manuscript and put the p-value in context with the effect size and variability of the data and perform further experiments to tackle the research question. Now, why is this? If you assume the colleague knows best, add a few new samples, see a different p-value and move forward with writing the manuscript, then this introduces interim analyses that can increase the false positive rate and it's not being transparently reported. For B, if you do not want to diverge from your sample size plan, so you switch the analysis, then this introduces analytical flexibility that can increase the false positive rate. And again, it's not transparently reported. In C, you put a note in the manuscript that the data were not significant and that they don't need to be shown. While non statistically significant data can still be important for making scientific inferences, so the data should be shown in a transparent way. And finally, D, doing the experiment as is, putting things in context and doing further experiments, well, this approach reduces reliance on only the p-value to make scientific inferences, it provides the highest level of transparency, and it includes multiple lines of evidence to aid in your results interpretation.
Now, let's look at the last of our five elements, publication transparency. So one major facet of transparency is reporting important study elements related to rigor, like blinding, randomization, and sample size estimation. However, a few studies actually report these items. This study used a text mining algorithm to measure reporting in over 1.5 million papers from PubMed. And despite some gains over the last 20 years, reporting is still very low. You can see for randomization, it tops out at about 30%, and sample size estimation and blinding are around 10%. So we still have a long way to go to improve reporting of these items. Well, why is not reporting these items such a problem? We discussed earlier some systematic reviews showing that inflated effect sizes occur when blinding and randomization were not reported. Well, in this meta-analysis of two dozen preclinical stroke papers, the authors went further and counted how many of the rigorous experimental design elements listed here were reported. And these include things like blinding, randomization, sample size estimation, and various controls. So they found that an increase in the number of reported quality elements correlated with a decrease in the effect size. And that none of the papers even came close to reporting all 10 quality elements. So this analysis adds support to earlier studies suggesting that a lack of reporting, just like low power, is associated with inflated effect sizes. And although we can't know for sure, this may be due to a lack of practice, meaning that these strategies were probably not even performed. Compounding these issues is publication bias, where only the most interesting results make it into literature. For example, let's say you've performed experiments to answer a research question, and you get really interesting results that also happen to be statistically significant. Well, you're probably going to work pretty hard to get those published. However, let's say they're just not that interesting, or you don't find any statistically significant results. Well, a lot of people will actually file those away. So this is partly due to scientists choosing not to publish, seeing such papers as less valuable for their careers, but it's also partially due to journals requiring novel results for publication. This, however, has the potential to distort the body of evidence related to a finding. For example, here on the right, this is a review of preclinical stroke studies, and it shows what's called a funnel plot. So this is the variability of the results, which correlates negatively with sample size, plotted against the effect size of the treatment. And you can see the published studies in the white circles. Now, as sample size increases, you see less variability in the effect size, creating this funnel shape. If all studies were reported, you'd expect to see similar distributions around the mean on both sides of the funnel. However, some studies with low sample size tend to only be published if there are positive results. We don't see much on the right side of the plot. So the authors use what's called a trim and fill method to estimate what a quote unquote unbiased distribution of the results might look like and those are shown in the red dots. And as you can see, if these studies existed in the literature, the overall effect size estimated by the meta-analysis, which you can see in the diamonds at the bottom, would be smaller. And so this shows that even systematic reviews that compile all literature in a field can exhibit inflated effect sizes due to publication bias. And so we are seeing a skewed version of the story, even when we're looking at all of the published literature. Now, true or false, you do not need to report experiments if they are difficult to compile or get published via traditional high-profile journals. The answer is false. Science is only as strong as the completeness and validity of the body of evidence, so negative or unexciting results are just as important as positive results for making the scientific inferences about what is known and for planning future experiments. It is wasteful not to report publicly what taxpayers have funded and if others end up repeating the same experiments unknowingly. And there are also multiple routes for sharing unpublished data through repositories and preprints. At this point, we've gone through five experimental design elements to help mitigate some of the issues we saw in this before cycle of low research quality. So now, with improved experimental design, we can turn it into a fee forward cycle of high research quality. With these five elements, you can make better hypotheses based on stronger prior literature. You can design rigorous studies with low risk of bias, high statistical power, and good quality control. You can plan your analyses to avoid analytical flexibility and false positives. And you can contribute sufficient information to the scientific literature to help strengthen the body of evidence in your field. 
I do want to make a quick note about exploration, though. So we can't always plan everything in advance, especially when we're trying to discover something new. We often distinguish between a couple different types of research. There's exploratory research, also known as discovery, observational, or hypothesis generating research. And this is research that's not designed to test a specific hypothesis. And in this case, elements of rigorous experimental design can still be incorporated where possible, for example, blinding, but are not necessarily required in every part of the experiment. On the other hand, there's confirmatory or hypothesis testing research. And this is research that should incorporate all applicable elements of rigorous experimental design to ensure proper execution and interpretation. I hear concern all the time from the scientific community that rigor and transparency will kill innovation and discovery. But I don't think this is the case because exploration is very important and we encourage it. What's most important is to be transparent about how the research was performed so that data can be interpreted in its appropriate context. Now that we're getting near the end of the presentation, I want to revisit the story of minocycline. So at this point, we know that it failed in a clinical trial of ALS, but we don't know why. Well, for our final case study, I want to look more closely at the original animal studies that showed survival benefits of minocycline. So from these four example papers, I found the following information. Two of them reported whether or not they blinded. One reported whether or not they randomized. The sample sizes ranged from 7 to 17 per group, but only one reported a reason for why they chose the sample size. None of them reported whether or not they excluded data or why, and it's unclear if their analyses were chosen in advance. And of course, we can't know what was not published. Were there negative studies that never made it into the literature? So knowing what you know now, which of the following five elements could have been better in these studies? A, controlling for bias, B, statistical power, C, quality control, D, analysis planning, or E, publication transparency. The answer is, of course, all of them. Each of these five elements could have been better implemented in the original minocycline mouse study. However, this isn't the end of our story. The ALS Therapy Development Institute actually went back and performed more rigorous studies on failed ALS drugs like minocycline in the SOD1 mouse model. After performing the preliminary study we discussed earlier in the presentation on control mice to determine optimal experimental design, they decided to blind technicians and investigators, they randomized mice to the treatment group, they used at least 24 mice per group and chose that number based on that prior study. They matched for sex and litter. They excluded mice with low transgene numbers and also those that died from study unrelated causes. They discussed in a prior paper the validity of particular analyses. However, one knock against them is that their work is mostly unpublished. So what they found is here on the right. In the light blue bars, that's the increased survival that was shown in the original animal studies for each of these different drugs. In the dark bars, however, those are the results from the new optimized studies from the ALS Therapy Development Institute. And in every single case, the new optimized studies showed small and sometimes negative effects of each of the drugs on survival. I want to highlight minocycline here. You can see that there's a big difference. So when the mouse studies were performed more rigorously, they better matched the results seen in clinical trials. And so imagine how much time, money, and patient risk could have been avoided if the original studies had just been performed more rigorously. So this is why we should care about rigorous preclinical research. So in summary, transparency, transparency, transparency. No matter what we do end up doing in our experiments, we need to be transparent about it so other people can interpret it correctly. Also, controlling for bias, ensuring sufficient statistical power, safeguarding quality control, planning analyses in advance, and reporting all relevant experimental and analytical details are vital for high quality research. And high quality preclinical research is a necessary first step for translating findings from the bench to the clinic. On this slide, I've added some resources that might be of interest to you. So you can go ahead and pause the video if you'd like to look up any of these websites or papers. So we have rigor and reproducibility resources from NIH. We have the website of our office at NINDS. 
and we have a page with a list of over 100 resources related to rigor that you might find helpful. Additionally, I have also listed a couple of publications where you can learn more about Ritter's experimental design elements. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope that this presentation was helpful and my contact information is here if you have any questions or would like to follow up.